today's event, Flash Enabled Availability, Evolving Beyond the Backup. Today's event is brought to you by Pure Storage and Veeam and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is David Davis from Actual Tech Media, and we've got a great event lined up for you today. Before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping here that we first need to cover. So we want this to be a really educational event. We want you to learn all about ransomware, data protection, disaster recovery, uh, the latest and greatest in flash storage. So we encourage you to use the questions box there in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we have expert presenters who I'll introduce here in just a moment, but use that questions box as much as you'd like. We'll be doing some, uh, some poll questions for you out there to, to get your responses, and we'll also be asking you uh, to type in your experience uh, when it comes to you know what you're doing with ransomware here coming up in the event. So use that questions box. We'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. And then we also have a really nice handout that I encourage you to check out there in the GoToWebinar control panel. It's called uh, Pure Storage and Veeam Backup and Replication for Protecting Mission Critical Data. It's a joint solutions brief. So make sure that you download that and you can read that after the event. And then finally, we'll have a $300 Amazon gift card that we'll be announcing the prize winner uh, for in, uh, at the end of the Q&A session, at the end of today's event. Full prize terms and conditions can be found on our website, events.actualtechmedia.com. I'm sorry if you're watching this event on, de on demand after the event. Uh, the drawing has already occurred. And with that, I'm excited to introduce today's presenters. They are Mr. Nick Saki, Principal System Engineer at Pure Storage and Mr. Joe Martin, Senior System Engineer at Veeam. Nick and Joe, thanks for being on the event today. Well, thanks Thank for you. Thanks us. for having us. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Joe and we can kick it off and get started. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining today. We've got uh, a lot of great material here to give you some advice as far as trying to solve what we call the ransomware challenge, which is just trying to make sure that you can recover extremely quickly from a ransomware attack. Uh, in this case, we'll be talking specifically about some solutions from both Pure and Veeam and, and how they enable that. So I think maybe to kick things off, if we can get a, the poll, first poll question out there, I'd just be curious to see how many people have actually we'll say experienced ransomware or seen it. So that could be maybe in your own environment, could be a, a friend of yours, uh, anything like that. But um, with it being so much in the news and we talk about that, theoretically, it'd be nice to know from everyone that uh, has joined us today who has uh, experienced that. So we'll give that yeah, a couple so more seconds. The, should see the poll question there on the screen. Uh, and answer that poll, and then after you do so, I encourage you to use the questions box there. Just test it out and answer this additional question. Um, that is, how you're protecting yourself from ransomware today. What are you doing? What do you have in place that helps you feel protected from ransomware? Or if you have nothing in place, feel free to put that in there today and say, you know, hey, I don't, I don't feel protected from ransomware. I'd, I'd be curious to learn that as well. And you can use that questions box. There, I see some of those already coming in. Uh, one person says they have nothing in place today. Another person says they have backup. Someone else says they have array-based snapshots that have saved me many times before. Uh, someone else says they're using Veeam with SAN replication. That's nice. So uh, lots of good feedback coming in there for you there, uh, Joe and Nick, to check out in the questions box. Uh, someone else says they have nothing in place. So obviously, this is a great event for anyone who's needing additional protection from ransomware. So it looks sure. like most everyone has voted in that poll. Let me share the results. And Joe says, it says 61% uh, said yes, they have seen ransomware. How's that stack up with what you've seen? You know, I, I whenever I've presented on ransomware at different events, in-person ones, and I ask for a show of hands, it's usually a little more than half of the people. So this does seem to kind of jive with, with what I've seen. And by the way, I find it interesting, there isn't anyone that shared that their plan is keeping a, a stash of Bitcoin. But uh, I was curious if anyone maybe was going to say that was their plan. But no, thank you uh, for, for doing that. So let's talk about some ransomware that just has been in the, the news. You may have seen some of these. There's some high-profile ones that I know have been in the news that people may have seen in, in Baltimore. Maryland was one. But some other ones that I just discovered while doing a little bit of research to find out have there been any other ones just this month. Discovered uh, quite a few. 
So looking at just since the beginning of July, there is a county in New Hampshire that uh, got attacked by ransomware, and they were being asked to pay the ransom and get their data back. Another one is a, a, the library system in a county in New York State. We've also got out in New York. So it's kind of a bad month to be in the Northeast, it seems like, uh, if you're worried about ransomware. So a college out there got hit, and they're being demanded $2 million to get their data back, which is not the largest that I've seen. I actually saw it's a, a Veeam customer that they use Veeam to recover, uh, but they were being asked to pay, I believe it was $34 million a couple of years ago. Uh, and then finally, here's one that's actually close to me. I'm, I'm in the Chicago area. And so these guys are in Indiana, and they were asked to pay $130,000 in Bitcoin. Um, now, in their case, they actually had an insurance policy. So that's something else that I learned. I didn't realize you could buy ransomware insurance, but apparently you can. So they only had to pay 30 of that 100000 But why did they pay this in the first place? You know, why do we see that folks are having to go out and pay all this money? And, and I think we can see some of that from just the way a couple of people responded to that initial question. You know, what are you doing today? And a few people said they don't really have something in place. And that's really the biggest problem that we've got right now is that there are a number of people who don't have anything and they're needing to try to figure out, okay, how can I protect myself? Um, and they may not even realize that, you know, a, a backup solution can be used for ransomware when architected appropriately. But, uh, you know, this whole concept of, of paying or not paying has been taken a step further. And I'd like to share this. It's a consortium of every mayor in the United States representing a town with a population of at least 30,000 people. So you can see here over 1,400 uh, mayors have all banded together and said, we will not pay the ransom, which is fine as long as they all have something in place to quickly recover from that. So a lot of the IT folks that are on this call today, many of you may be getting some pressure as far as, you know, how do you make certain that your systems are up? And so I'm going to turn it over to Nick here, and we'll let Nick kind of speak a little bit about some of the things that Pure does, because I want to make sure everyone is is kind of level set and, and, and familiar with Pure as a, a, a solution um, uh, then we'll talk a little bit about Veeam, and then we'll actually dive into the details as far as how to bring these two together and protect, your, protect yourselves. But Nick, if you want to take over here. Thank you, Joe. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I wanted to, to I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you, and I wanted to cover um, who is Pure Storage and what do we do? Um, Primarily, obviously, we deliver enterprise class block file and object storage. It's made effortless, efficient, and evergreen by virtue of our uh, very unusual and industry leading support and sustainment model. So primarily we deliver um, hardware and software uh, to provide primary and secondary and backup and recovery data services or data infrastructure um, in your facility, in your organization, as well as connecting it to the cloud. So we have you know, cloud data software and infrastructure and then cloud data services. Um, and what we provide is a holistic, perpetual fixed cost lifecycle sustainment model called Evergreen Storage, which ensures that your hardware and your software never get old and they never cost you any more than your initial service price. We also provide Evergreen Storage as a service where it's essentially a consumption model and you're paying for only consumed consumption of the storage on-prem. So we're looking at data as, as a wholesale commodity. Um, and then of course, to tie all of this together for a backup recovery and protection mechanism, uh, we partner with Veeam. So Joe and I are here today to talk to you how uh, the two technologies combined can provide you with a holistic data service platform uh, that provides you with tremendous performance, uh, tremendous cost advantages, and obviously tremendous protection capability. So we, we are uh, very happy uh, to be here. And the fundamental bottom line is our, our mission is to deliver outcomes that matter to our customers by enabling them to accelerate all their applications, enabling multi-cloud agility and leveraging, um, obviously, a, a variety of cloud service providers uh, to enable DevOps agility, modernize your data protection, and finally build a data hub rather than building data silos or data swamps. Uh, so this provides you with basically the primary data service to support your entire enterprise uh, from end to end and in a way that is simple, sustainable, robust, and protected and resilient. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the particularly significant feature of uh, our Purity Flash Array operating environment um, that provides you with the data security from full business continuity with our built-in synchronous replication called Active Cluster to multi-site replication to space-efficient local and remote snapshots. And this is uh, particularly relevant as this is exactly how we tie in with Veeam and the capabilities that Veeam leverages to protect um, our customers' data. So next slide, please. All right, thank you, Nick. And so just uh, to kind of summarize maybe the, the Veeam side of the story here, uh, many of you may be familiar with Veeam. Uh, what I find those those that say, yes, I know Veeam, think of us as the virtualization guys. You know, Veeam comes in and, and protects a VMware environment or maybe a Hyper-V environment. And really we've moved well beyond that um, over the years. So we've added support for protecting physical servers. You know, that started off with uh, x86 servers running Windows and Linux. Today we've even got Solaris and AIX in that story. Uh, it could be software as a service, you know, protecting Office 365 and not just Exchange emails, but the full gamut of things with SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, support multiple cloud vendors. And so the idea here is that by leveraging various portions of the Veeam availability platform, you can protect your workloads no matter what those workloads are or where they run. And on top of that, being able to move those workloads around. So if you need the flexibility to say, I'm going to today take a physical server, move it into my VMware environment, uh, maybe in another couple of years, I want to move that out to uh, Azure, run it there, uh, but ultimately I still want to protect it. And then maybe those backups of that uh, Azure environment, I want to be able to bring those back down on premises and, and copy them out somewhere. We can manage that full life cycle of moving the workload around, protecting it at each point in the game, and being able to actually control where that data protection is stored. And so what you see sort of at the bottom there in the boxes, that's really the different functions that we've got, depending upon whether we're talking about the backup and replication, Veeam availability suite, availability orchestrator. There's a number of different pieces in the Veeam family that make up what we call the availability platform. And so all these pieces come together to allow you to do all those workloads, but at the same time integrate with the hardware investments you have, such as with pure flash array and flash blade and things like that. And, and we'll be talking um, a little bit more about that as we go along. So final generic thing, I guess I'll say, uh, before we start to get into some specific things that you can do to protect yourselves from ransomware, the key thing is to understand there is no one single magic bullet that will protect you from ransomware. And what I mean is, don't look at this presentation thinking, if I do this one thing that was on the slide 14, then I'm good and I don't have to worry about anything else. Because really it's about layering your defenses and saying, okay, of all the different tips that were given, I'm going to implement maybe three or four of them. That's what's going to give you the best protection. Because if you rely on just one particular thing to protect you, at some point there's a chance you're going to still have a failure. Um, and, I, and by one single thing, I don't mean that if you implement Veeam, that's one thing. There's about five or six different things we're gonna cover in Veeam alone that can be done to give you that protection. But that's the thing to always keep in mind from ransomware because it's ever evolving, always changing. You've got to look at different ways uh, of being able to protect yourself. So one of the first ones I want to bring up, and someone actually alluded to that at the very beginning uh, when people were responding with what have they done to protect themselves, is offline storage. So I don't know how many people here have, have seen the show Mr. Robot. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the show. And for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with it, it's this hacker community, if you will, following everything that they do and, and their battles against society, if you will. But the thing to keep in mind, what's going on in the show is any of the attacks that they do, it all involves connected environments. And that's what ransomware is doing, is trying to find out what uh, storage systems and x86 systems are all out there, what are window shares that are out there, and I want to encrypt any of the data I find. In fact, in some cases, it may even specifically try to find backup files sitting out there. So by having storage that's offline, meaning it's not up and presented and live in a way that ransomware can see it, then we can go ahead and give yourselves that extra bit of protection so that even if your production data becomes encrypted, at least your backups aren't. And so one of the key ways you can do that is through our integrations with pure storage snapshots, which is what someone mentioned, they're using storage snapshots and recover data multiple times. So we can enable that. And Nick, I'll let you talk a little bit specifically about how you guys uh, handle snapshots. 
Thanks, Joe. Uh, as, as Joe said, Veeam leverage is one of the key capabilities of the flash array to mitigate and defeat ransomware, uh, the, the ability to take limitless instantaneous snapshots. So pure storage is, snapshots are immutable, so there's no risk of data contamination from ransomware in the snapshot itself. So essentially, it's a pristine uh, image of the data that was taken. Uh, and because the snapshots are always thin provisioned, deduplicated and compressed, they're extremely space efficient. So you get priceless protection at no additional cost. Um, in, in short, because a flash array is always compressing or deduplicating data, anytime a snapshot is taken, it is essentially an exact duplicate of the, of the volume that was snapped. Therefore, logically, it takes up no space in the array. Now, the other nice thing about the snapshots is they can be replicated off-site and remounted as volumes, either on the original source array or on remote arrays to facilitate continuity of operations, disaster recovery, and conventional backup and restore. And all of that can be orchestrated from within Veeam. So it doesn't even require you know, separate management or a separate management plane in order to happen. Now, when you mount a snapshot as a volume, we create a copy of the snapshot and mount that copy as the new volume, and that preserves the integrity of the original snapshot. So there's no vector for ransomware to infect the snapshot, and restoring that snapshot instantaneously, as Nick Hannes noted, uh, basically presents an environment that is completely free of the ransomware that infected the system to begin with. Uh, snapshots are fully independent of their parent, so there's no inherent dependency on the source snapshot to its children, so they can be deleted in any sequence and still not affect any of the subsequent snapshots or the original parent. So this provides a, a tremendous level of, of protection, resiliency, efficiency, and return to operations uh, because snapshot restores are instantaneous. Um, this is a, a tremendously powerful capability that gets implemented with tremendous simplicity as well. So you don't have any penalty for overhead or reservations or planning that's required. You can have flexible consistency groups, so you can be snapshotting different groups of, of volumes um, that are related to each other or that are critical to your operations or that are relevant to particular applications. However you want to do that is entirely up to you. Um, they can be mounted, read, written, snapshotted again. We can take snapshots of snapshots, but there's no dependencies, as we said, on one another, and they all have full performance. As we said, they are tremendously space efficient and they can be recovered anywhere. So you really have a tremendously uh, liberating, but also highly resilient and highly protected mechanism for protecting your data. All right. Thank you, Nick. Sure. And so some things to, to think about as we go even a step further. So what Nick just described was for your production storage, ways to be able to protect yourself and being able to recover directly from that, and you can actually uh, enable that with Veeam. So rather than um, going and finding your own way to try to mount the data and things like that, if you've got Veeam, we can see those snapshots allow you to recover data from them. But ultimately, there may be times when you still need to go to some sort of backup repository and recover data. So taking that, that offline backup concept and kind of just changing it slightly, so the sheer nature of some sort of repository where backup sits it has to be online. Otherwise, there isn't a way to get the data there. But you want to still at least mask it from ransomware. So at the end of the day, as far as ransomware is concerned, it's still offline. And if we look at what it typically is doing, um, this type of malware is looking for window shares of some sort, whether they be hosted on Windows themselves or on some sort of platform via SIFS or Samba. And so by talking uh, about other ways of doing it, we can look at portions of the pure family, so specifically FlashBlade, uh, which is uh, you know a flash solution specifically for a target. Uh, and then there's also Object Engine, which adds on to that. Um, and what you can do in this case, and, and Nick, I'll let you talk a little bit more about the technologies, but the pieces that, I, that are really relevant to this part of the discussion is you can talk to FlashBlade using NFS. So now we're not talking SIFs. Uh, and then by leveraging Object Engine, an object storage solution, it presents itself as S3 storage. So again, it's something ransomware can't take uh, and, and encrypt because ransomware can't even see it. And really from a Veeam perspective, we can't tell the difference. It could be Object Engine, it could be Amazon S3, it still all looks like S3 to us. So that's the beauty yeah. of, of this. Right, Joe, it just presents as a simple target to, to Veeam, so it doesn't really require any, any serious thinking or special configuration in order to function. It's just easy. Yes, exactly, exactly. So these are 
additional ways of, of protecting yourselves. Now, another thing that I, I like to bring up is disaster recovery planning. Um, because a lot of times when people think about DR, they're thinking of the traditional types of disasters. So earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes, fires, you know, natural disasters. But what people don't often really think about is that the planning you're doing for DR can also be used in a ransomware situation because it's still a disaster. It just happens to be a man-made disaster. And so if you want to look at trying to get things up and running quickly, there's replication. So for instance, it could be replicating at the VM level because now the VMs at the target site, those replicas, those can just be used as a source for recovering data, individual files or other types of application items. And plus as part of the replication story, there's replication, you know, say from a flash array to flash array. Uh, and then on top of that, we like to talk about orchestration. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk Veeam specific here, a particular solution in the availability platform called Veeam Availability Orchestrator that allows you to do automated testing of your DR. And anytime it does this, it documents what's going on. So it documents your DR plan. But the point in this is that any of these facilities that you may be looking at, uh, or maybe you've already put in place in your environment, thinking about natural disasters, these can all be used as quick recovery methods for uh, protecting, or excuse me, from recovering from ransomware. And Nick, you, you want to talk a little bit about specifically some of the DR aspects here with uh, uh, Peer? Absolutely. So in this diagram, we're depicting a workflow that provides tremendous protection of the data, resiliency against attacks and other unfortunate events, and provides tremendous speed and agility in restoring data to the enterprise. And that facilitates, obviously, a rapid return to operations. So this is particularly valuable protection against ransomware because it provides data isolation as well as seamless automation and orchestration of data recovery. And that's what that's what Veeam provides as the glue that binds this architecture together. So the backup copy job is a separate task that needs to be set apart from the backup job. And you're copying the backup. So in this instance, we're showing two secondary targets. Uh, the, primary, the primary backup target is a flash blade, and Veeam is backing up the server from the primary storage, obviously, to the primary backup. The secondary piece of that is copying the data to a second flash blade that can either be on-premises or off-premises. And this is you know, demonstrating what Joe talked about, having offline secondary copies. Um, the, so the aim of the backup copy job is to copy a restore point from the source backup repository to the target backup repository. Every backup copy job creates its own folder on the target backup repository and it stores it and stores to it all the copied restore points. So the folder has the same name as the backup copy job and this um, the, the backup copy job runs continuously and has you know several phases. It's idle, then it does a synchronization process does its transform operations, and then do, does its post-job activities. What this does is it protects against a flash blade outage or an interruption, and that, you know, in this case, we're probably thinking more along the lines of either a, a physical interruption or a logical interruption. Um, but the other nice part about this is it performs an integrity check of the backup data to ensure that the data is good on both of the flash blades. So you've got a guaranteed um, restore to uh, pristine data from either one of the sources or from yeah from either one of the backup sources the other nice thing is given the the throughput of the flash blade the restore times of this data are tremendously reduced you're looking at anywhere between you know 10x to 90x reduction in restore times versus you know recovering from tape or recovering from a purpose built backup appliance so you you know again emphasizing our themes here of security integrity and performance you get disaster recovery that gets you back in operations uh, as quickly as possible. Oh, thank you, Nick. And so that's important regardless of what the disaster is. So for sure in a, a ransomware scenario where critical data has been encrypted, being able to recover very quickly, such as through these uh, DR capabilities, is, is hugely beneficial. And, and the reason why we talk about, you know, how quickly can you get data back is ultimately, you know, users have certain expectations. And it, and it doesn't matter if it's ransomware or some other outage. Everyone expects things to be available all the time, right? I, I can log into my Gmail account and, and I expect it to always be there, and it's not. I mean, there's even been times with those solutions that it, it's been um, – unavailable, which then always makes the news, but because of how reliable those are, people expect, well, all, all this, 
well, these corporate resources all need to be available all the time. And so being able to recover quickly is key. And so that's one of the reasons we talk about restoring the minimum so that ultimately when something occurs, you get up and running quickly. Because no matter how much you, you architect things, if ultimately, let's say, you're able to stop the ransomware attack very quickly and just a small number of files were uh, encrypted, you don't want to have to turn around and recover an entire entire file server or maybe an entire virtual disk. Uh, why not just recover just a few files in that scenario? And so that's why one of the things that we've prided ourselves for, at Veeam for a very long time are all the different restore methods we give. Because what I often will joke and say, look, if all you need is backup solutions, you know, I can write a script that maybe does some cloning or something like that, and now you technically have a backup solution. But how easily are you going to get your data back? How quickly are you going to restore it? And so that's that's the key here, and that's what we call out with this slide, uh, which is probably even outdated given the, the recent enhancements that we've got the, the ship a little bit earlier this year, we're probably well over 60 different restore scenarios with even more coming in our next release. But as of the last official count, 57 different ways of restoring data. And so that's key in a, in a ransomware attack is I want to do whatever's needed to get myself running the quickest. And so that's gonna be the mi most minimal amount of data being recovered. Uh, in the environment. Um, but regardless of whether it's a little data or a lot of data, you still have to look at the performance of the environment and how quickly you can get that data back. So Nick, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the performance aspects here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we're talking about is, is a couple of cost items here. The business value of rapid restores uh, measured in two ways. Obviously, the amount of um, money and time saved by getting back into operation as quickly as possible, but we're talking about ransomware as all. Well. You're actually avoiding paying the ransom altogether. Um, so given, you know, the ability to restore, you know, a virtual machine in two minutes uh, versus an industry standard of 85 minutes, just, just in the cost of people sitting around doing nothing, uh, it gets pretty expensive. There's also, when you measure this in commercial terms, there's a loss of business, but when measured in, in public sector terms, it's the loss of constituent services or agency operations. And then of course, there's that ransom note hanging over our heads. So we're avoiding all of those costs and getting back into operations as quickly as possible. Um, and that's why it makes a lot of sense to use high performance storage platforms uh, for these kinds of operations. It actually does wind up saving a tremendous amount of time, effort, and lost resources in trying to get back into operations. So Lee Gong actually had a pretty good question here also in that the procedure we're talking about seems you know, more reactive as opposed to proactive. Um, and the question he asked was, is it correct to assume you must rem remediate any affected host prior to bringing data back online? And there's, there's an answer to that that is, it depends. Um, if the hosts, for example, are booting themselves off of the SAN and we've restored a snapshot, that no longer has that ransomware in there, then the remediation happens simply as a function of uh, snapshot recovery and getting back into business. You may, we're assuming in, in some cases here, as we talk about this, that you've been infected. And very often this just happens through, you know, a desktop terminal, a, a phishing attack, um, or some other vector through the front door. So we kind of have to assume that we've been contaminated. And the methodologies we're discussing here are how do you decontaminate your data and get your hosts back online. Now, if there are you know persistent algorithms or pieces of malware that are sitting on the host side, then yeah, you got to decontaminate the host, um, or you've got to decontaminate the endpoint. Um, VDI actually helps save your bacon in this instance as well, because you can simply bring back pristine snapshots from uh, from the VDI sets and bring the users back in line without having to necessarily rebuild everything. And the, the beauty of the solution that we're talking about is Veeam and Pure Storage make it very easy to restore a single file or whole snapshots of drive images or virtual machines or what have you, or even tens of thousands of them all instantaneously. So the recovery process from you know, basically disinfecting yourself is tremendously more efficient in an architecture like this because we can move the data so fast. And that is very often the longest pole in the tent to recovery is just simply restoring the data. Joe, mm -hmm. what do you think? 
Um, I agree with that, and what I'd say, too, to add on to it, a couple of Veeam-specific things will be coming up still in the presentation where we'll talk about how to prevent reinfecting yourself uh, because of the fact that ransomware often is actually dormant for a significant amount of time before it finally activates. So talk about some ways of being uh, preventing reinfection when you do have to restore, as well as being able to just to keep tabs of what's going on in your environment and trying to discover what's there and being able to shut it down quickly. But at the end of the day, I mean, trying to prevent ransomware from coming in at all. I mean, some of that is user training. There's some other stuff, but really, Nick, you're spot on. It's about how to go ahead and clean up that contamination as quickly as possible and making sure as part of that process, you're not reinfecting yourself and also making certain that you're just keeping tabs on things so that you can uh, react uh, extremely quickly when something does come up and prevent ransomware from spreading too far. So no, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, and one of the things that I want to mention on this slide before I move on, instant recovery that you see down at that table, I mean, that, that's hugely beneficial. And I, what I'll add on to Nick's points, just as he dis discussed kind of the initial performance aspects here noted on the slide, is that I've had many discussions with customers that are so focused on capacity but not performance when it comes to storing their backups. So they think all they need is a bunch of disk. Who cares what the speed is? It's just for backups, right? But again, when disaster strikes, which is what we're talking about here, and you want to get back up and running quickly, if you've bought yourself some cheap disk down from Best Buy, you know, and, and I'm not going to name out any vendors, but there's a lot of solutions out there that you can go and buy, you know, real cheap drives are really big. You go to try to restore, it's going to take a while. And something like Instant Recovery, by the way, can be extremely beneficial. So if, if let's say, a single file server w was hit and you're able to uh, make certain that nobody's machine is otherwise infected, Instant Recovery allows you to actually boot up that file server from the most recent backup running directly off a of flash blade. So now you've got something with the kind of performance as a production SAN, and users can't even tell the fact that you're not running off the production environment, that you're running right from the backup environment. And you can see here average restore times. That restore time is not to actually restore it because you don't even have to. It's the amount of time it takes to boot it up and get it running because once it's booted up, it's presented to the environment. Users have no idea where it's running. So in under a couple of minutes, all of a sudden you've got a clean copy of that VM just up and running in the environment, servicing user requests. Exactly. And and very often over the course of, of decades now, we've become largely fixated on backup. Um, and as you said, Joe, at the expense of the whole purpose of the exercise, which is recovery. So backup is the means by which we have something to actually restore or recover. And that's exactly why we we engineered this joint solution with Veeam is to present provide the capability to not only back up your data securely, but also to bring it back as quickly as possible. Yes. So continuing on, and this is actually to the, the point of the, the question that was just asked in the chat, you know, um, part of it is at least not reinfecting yourself. And that's something that we can do using a, a function I call data labs. And what data labs are, it's a way to have a, a sandbox or isolated environment as far as the network is concerned and being able to do something with it by just leveraging your backups. And the original use case of this was to test your backups, a way to be able to spin things up, kind of like the instant recovery I just mentioned, but you spin it up in an isolated environment, verify your backups are good. But now, since we're worried about ransomware, you know, to the point uh, that I made a, a couple of minutes ago that it sometimes remain dormant for a period of time. In fact, I had one of our partners tell me a story. He had a customer that was hit and in that customer's environment, ransomware actually was dormant for a year. So by the time they did enough forensics to determine when did it come into the environment, it came in a year later is when it started encrypting things. And the reason they do this, they think that you're not going to have retention going that far back, that you're not going to have any backups you can use. And so as far as if you're trying to do that forensics, trying to figure out where it occurred, Data Labs allows you to do that using a specific feature called Secure Restore. What that does is let's say you've had ransomware come in, you've cleaned it up, but now you're getting requests to restore a, a file server maybe the entire server as of how it looked uh, two months ago. You need to be able to spin it up, or maybe it's a SQL server. I mean, who knows what could have been impacted anyways. And the last thing you want is to recover this uh, older version of this uh, VM and spin it up. And next thing you know, 
you've reinfected yourself because it actually has a dormant version of ransomware sitting inside of it. That was the actual attack vector from which it was launched everywhere else. So a secure restore allows you to do is instead of booting up the VM, the capability of just mounting the drives and then running the latest uh, malware, anti-malware solution that you have in your environment. It's typically there's updates that come out. And so even though ransomware may have come in because at the time your solution didn't detect it, since then it has received updates and it would detect it. So during the secure restore process, we look at it, we examine it. Is ransomware in there or any kind of malware? If the answer is yes, then either you, you just stop altogether or maybe you continue and boot up the VM, but you put it now in or in the isolated environment. So you keep it in the data labs environment. And if the answer is no, it's not infected, then you can continue on with the restore process and not have to worry about anything. So this is very, very beneficial. In fact, it's actually, uh, we've got uh, patents we've applied for for this unique technology. And then you can see the word data labs being mentioned other ways. So whether we're talking about is testing using your backups, testing using replicas, or storage snapshots. Uh, and in fact, that's a, a real interesting one because I can actually do what we call an on-demand sandbox that allows me to spin up the VMs in this isolated environment but run them directly from snapshots sitting on that flash array. So there's a lot of ways of getting VMs up and running but still isolating them until you can be absolutely certain that they're clean and then at that point, continuing on with the store process. You do not want to reinfect yourself. Education, I had mentioned that earlier. Uh, it doesn't matter who you're using as far as a backup vendor or storage vendor. If you don't train your users, you're going to run into issues. You know, and this is a sample email, and this one's a pretty horrible one. It, it would not take a very skilled person to realize that you know, application-ralphservice.com is not amazon.com. And you don't even have to be an English major to recognize that the grammar in here is also pretty bad. But some of them are a lot more difficult to, to pick up these days. Um, so I can't stress enough education. It's, you know, there's not a specific backup solution that's gonna suddenly educate your users. There's not a storage solution that will educate your users, but there are different third-party solutions that specifically just deal with training. Uh, when I presented this to crowds, in fact, I just did this last week. Um, one that was mentioned was a company called No Before. And I don't know how many uh, on the uh, the phone here maybe ever used it, um, but one story that a customer told me that when they first hired No Before or began using their services, what they did is they had No Before send out a phishing email because that's how they do a test. They send out phishing emails to your users and they see how many people click on the links in there. And if they do click on the links, the users are not taken to you know, a bad site with, with any kind of malicious software. They're taken to a training site saying, you clicked on a phishing email, you need to do the following courses. Anyway, so when they first brought in No Before, sent out the phishing emails just to see what it would look like in their environment, uh, around 50%, so about half of the users clicked on it. After six months of, of various online trainings and things like that to try to educate users on how to spot phishing, they did another round of those emails, less than 5% of the users did it. So that's something to think about in your own environment is, you know, since we can't take the keyboards and mice away from the users, we need to educate them. That's definitely a key part of everything else that we've talked about as far as technology that you can implement. You know, in, in taking this even a step further, you know, phishing may be going out and, and trying to find users that just aren't aware, but there's also times when just people on the inside actually are a threat. And in fact, this uh, Wall Street Journal article from a couple of years ago goes into, de goes into detail about the different types of insider threats that occur. Um, it could be, you know, a, a simple mistake, as we've already talked about. It could be someone being malicious. They know that uh, they, they're being laid off in a couple of weeks, so they want to go ahead and do whatever they can. And, and heaven forbid, if, if someone who has access to the backups can do this, maybe they're going to go out and try to delete those. Or maybe someone's just going to try to introduce ransomware to take revenge out. There's a lot of different things that you have to keep in mind. And so that's why having visibility on what's going on in the environment is absolutely critical. Um, and so again, to the, the question that we answered recently, you know, since it seems like this is reactive, one of the things you can do, even though it's somewhat reactive, it allows you to hopefully spot things early on, is to actually be on the lookout if you have an ongoing 
uh, ransomware attack. So part of the, the, the Veeam availability platform, so part of the solutions that we have is a specific monitoring and reporting solution called Veeam One. And it's got an alarm, and in fact, I've got a sample here just showing you know, what the interface looks like, where the alarms would be. Now it's illustrating for Hyper-V, this would also exist for VMware uh, VMs, but it's going to let you know if there's ongoing ransomware. Right? And, and we're looking for certain indicators, so things like high CPU, a lot of disk writes, uh, a lot of network activity. These are things indicative of a machine being attacked, and so all the files are being encrypted and rewritten in encrypted format. So if you do get that triggered, then you can also hopefully quickly realize that and go out, take a look at which machine is actually doing this, you know, what's the source of the attack, and at least shut it down. Um, you know, and then you know, with this uh, uh, Veeam 1 alarm, by the way, if you're worried that, well, what if I get false positives, you know, maybe I've got a SQL uh, database that gets hit constantly, it's very active, so I'm always going to have high CPU on that SQL server, and I'm going to have a lot of disk I.O., that's fine because you can also come in here into any of these alarms and determine you know, which thresholds do you want to uh, trigger it, as well as what part of the environment do you want it to monitor. So the scope does not need to be the entire environment. You can actually exclude certain servers, or maybe exclude database servers, or go a step further and say, I only want to monitor very specific servers, such as uh, file servers that I may have out there in the environment. But I can't stress enough that visibility is important to see what's going on. And so that ultimately what all of this stuff kind of comes back to is what we call the 3 to one rule. Or the little Veeam spin is the 3 to one zero rule. Uh, anytime you've heard a presentation from Veeam, at least you probably heard a 3 to one rule. I'm sure you may have heard that from other vendors as well. And what we're talking about is making sure you've got three copies of your data. On a, and, and one of those copies, by the way, is your production data. So your production plus two backups. Three copies on at least two different media, one of which is off-site and hopefully offline. And then the other piece that's the little Veeam spin is making sure you don't have any errors. Uh, because ultimately, if you do all these backups, you never test anything, you assume it's going to work. When the time comes that you need it to work, that's a horrible time to find out that actually you've got a problem and backups maybe haven't been running quick, uh, correctly. In fact, it reminds me of something back in the mid '90s. So back then, you know, tape uh, ruled. People may remember old DAT cartridges back then. So there was a school district that I remember we had uh, set up uh, backup for them, had a tape drive in their machine and ran the first test backup, it was fine. So we went and took that tape out and put in their first tape. Uh, thought we had instructed them to swap tapes. You know, all the tapes were clearly labeled Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, then we come back two weeks later after the install and we're told that backups haven't been running and we look and backups haven't been running since we left because the job was set to eject the media and no one knew to pop in the new media. So, it's always important to make certain you know your backups are are working properly. So going back to this three to one rule, you know we've discussed multiple ways of doing that. So you've got the ability to have you know multiple uh, flash arrays with data being uh, synchronized between them, being replicated. Um, you've also got backups going to FlashBlade. You can have multiple FlashBlades, as you saw earlier. Nick discussed using what Veeam calls a backup copy job to copy backups from one FlashBlade to another. We talked a little bit about the cloud. So whether that be true public cloud like Azure Blob or S3, or that be uh, on-premises on object storage, such as the object engine uh, from Pure, but the point being is by leveraging all of these, you're able now to really protect yourself regardless of the DR uh, scenario that comes up. So it could be something very basic as just, hey, I'm a user, I actually deleted a file or I deleted an email, I need to get it back, to I've got some sort of hardware outage to my data center burned to the ground. Um, as long as all of this is architected properly, and when I say properly, so for instance, don't have your DR site be across the street because if a tornado comes through, you're probably still in trouble. So you might want to have your DR site maybe being a little bit further away. But as long as you architect this 3 to one rule properly and you do testing of everything, which is the zero piece, now you can be confident you can recover from any type of scenario, uh, especially uh, ransomware attacks. So with that, I will go ahead and 
draw to a close as far as slides go, and we will uh, open it up here if we've had any other questions come in. Absolutely. Yeah, great presentation, Joe and Nick. Uh, I know that you all have answered a number of the questions throughout the webinar. Let's see, there are still a few questions here. Maybe we can we can uh, review. Um, Don is asking, what are the steps that we should take to ensure that we protect the Veeam backup server? So the backup server, by default, uh, runs something called a configuration backup. And so uh, with, with the Veeam architecture, we leverage a SQL database to hold information like such as, you know, the different jobs you've set up. So that's what's all stored in that configuration backup. So that's why I always encourage people to take a second copy of that. So kind of follow the three to one rule for that. Uh, that config backup by default goes to the very first repository that was created in the environment, but you can then copy that to another repository or copy it to a VM. The config backup is pretty small, and that way, if you do have something that comes up, this is a matter of installing Veeam and then restoring that config backup. But what's also nice about the Veeam architecture, worst case, in case many of you weren't aware of this, let's say you've lost the Veeam server, and you don't have the config backup either, there's metadata stored inside all of the Veeam backup files. So worst case, it's install Veeam, add your repository back in, all those backup files get scanned, and now we know what's been backed up and what's stored in there. The only thing you'd be recreating in that case is all your different backup jobs and replication jobs and things like that. But maintaining a copy of that config backup is the number one way to uh, protect the Veeam backup server. Okay. Okay, excellent. And I want to encourage everyone, if you have questions about what you've learned about on the event today, now is the time to ask them. Uh, we do have our prize giveaway coming up, but we're going to be doing some more questions up until then. So let's see, another question here, uh, and Nick, you may have answered this electronically, but I think it'd be good to review. Uh, what about immutability? Immutability. What is that exactly, and how does that help when it comes to protecting from ransomware? That's a great question. So one of the keys to success here is that uh, pure storage of snapshots are read only. Uh, so they can't be written to not by the system and not by the host once they have been taken. So this means that the data in a snapshot is always pristine. And as I said, even when we when we mount a volume from a snapshot internally, what we're doing is taking a snapshot of the snapshot and then mounting that as the volume. So the snapshots retain their pristine nature and the data on them is is not writable or so that's protection measure number one and that's how we guarantee the integrity of the data in the snap and the integrity of the data upon restore okay okay excellent yeah that way the ransomware cannot access that data it's it's totally protected uh, let's see another question that came in here uh, Nick you may have mentioned this but the term flash to flash to cloud what what exactly is that? And and when you say flash to flash, which flash products are we talking about here? Obviously, we're talking about pure storage flash arrays and flash blades. But the 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 genesis of this was as data architectures have grown and as data sets have grown, um, the platforms that have been used for data protection in the past, uh, the purpose built backup appliances are really good for doing exactly one thing, and that's copying data from point A to point B and back to point A again. Um, but they're very inflexible, and they're single-purpose platforms. Uh, the rest of the computing industry is quickly moving away from inflexible technologies to agile and elastic solutions. You just witness the rise of cloud, and of course, virtualization and um, large-scale orchestration, containerization, and things of that nature. Uh, more importantly, these systems are really noteworthy for their poor performance when data needs to be recovered. Um, in a blog that we republished, um, Denny Cherry and Associates Consulting, uh, the title was, if you thought database restores were slow, try restoring from another vendor's backup platform. They estimated that a six terabyte database would have taken 25 days to fully restore. Now that's an estimation because they killed the job after 24 hours and only 2% of the job being completed. Um, so this caused us to ask, what if we did this differently? Now Flashblade is a tremendously powerful system and it's capable of doing an awful lot of things at the same time. Um, it's primarily designed as a large scale file and object storage platform for doing things like big data analytics and cybersecurity analytics and 
uh, Internet of Things support, artificial intelligence, um, things for which very high bandwidth and huge degrees of parallelism and concurrency are necessary. But what that means is it's able to serve um, multiple different applications and multiple different application types simultaneously with exceptional performance. So we thought to ourselves, what if we used it as a backup and recovery target? What would the benefits of that be? And the answer was, especially when combined with Veeam, you get tremendous data efficiency by virtue of the data already being uh, compressed and deduplicated when it's written, but also tremendous restore speed because a flash blade can read data back out at up to 15 gigabytes a second. So you're looking at reducing large-scale re restore jobs to you know minutes versus hours, days, weeks, or months. And when we implement the 3210 three, model for data protection that Veeam espouses, um, you also have the ability to put this data in another location or put it in the cloud. So now you have end-to-end -end data protection and you have data segregation and isolation uh, via air gap or off-premises. And that's why we call it flash to flash to cloud. Very nice, very nice. And another question came in here around that, and Joe, maybe you could answer this, and that, that is, what clouds are supported? Sure. Uh, so from a, a Veeam perspective, there's specific integrations with uh, Azure Blob, uh, with Amazon S3, uh, as well as anything that's Amazon S3 compatible. So you know, Object Engine is, is another one of those examples. Um, and that's for the storage aspect, or if just we look at, and we didn't really touch on, but another part of the, uh, the story here, like when I mentioned data labs and being able to restore stuff into a temporary area, uh, you could restore virtual machines actually into the cloud and use that as a test bed since that's not part of your environment if you're trying to see if these older backups had ransomware in them. And then, so in that case, it's it's uh, Azure, Microsoft Azure, as well as Amazon AWS. Uh, we can restore VMs as EC2 instances. So uh, quite a few options there as far as uh, clouds go. Okay, okay, excellent. And I'll hand this question over to either one of you who want to answer it. Um, it is... What's the difference between DR planning versus ransomware, you know, planning and protection? Do you do anything different for one versus the other one? Well, I'll tell you my take at least is I, I view them really as, as one and the same. So I think what happens is people get so focused on the traditional types of disasters when do DR planning that they don't think about the fact that that can also be used for ransomware. And so from a ransomware perspective, it's it's usually just, uh, you know, I want to make sure I've got firewalls in place and things like that, and then I'm going to make sure I've got backups and I can recover my backups. But doing just a very simple backup strategy uh, may leave yourself to the uh, um, state where not only is your production data encrypted, but uh, as are your backups. And now you really are in no different scenario than if you didn't have backups at all. And so that's why I always like to let people know that, look, if you are planning for disasters, whatever types of DR you put in for the worst case scenario, I mean, ransomware really is the worst case scenario. It's just not bound by any kind of geography. Um, so the, that planning can really be one and the same. Okay. All right. Excellent. And then another question here. Um, when we talk about uh, the, the flash arrays from Pure, um, Christopher is asking, essentially, how would you get started? Like, what are the, the different models, you know, in, maybe in a smaller scenario that you would select to do the flash to flash, Nick? It, kind of what's the entry point in this design? Sure, I actually just got done answering Christopher online. Um, we make systems to support a, a very wide range of infrastructure needs from as small as you know 10 terabytes all the way up to uh, massive multi-petabyte scale infrastructures. So that also begs the question of how do you want to consume it? Uh, we obviously can sell a system as a CapEx capability. We work with leasing partners to provide them as leases. And of course we have an OpEx only model. So it really depends on you know how big is the what what's your need? We we make systems that that run a wide range of capacities and prices in order to make adoption as as consumer friendly as possible. Excellent, excellent. And then here's an interesting question uh, from Garth. He's asking about you know when we talk about putting data in the cloud. Of course, with public cloud, there could be some some fees associated with pulling data back out. 
are there other options for, you know, can we replicate data to a, maybe a, another company site instead of using the cloud? Or what do you recommend in that case? Well, we support uh, a number of different things there. So, you know, earlier when I said which clouds, I was kind of thinking along the lines of public cloud. And so kind of answered, you know, who are the different vendors that we've got integration with there. But we do have a number of Veeam uh, cloud service providers who are offering Veeam-based services that are running in their own environments. And so it's a different type of cloud, more of a private or managed cloud, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and so that gives you the uh, option to be able to, you know, copy your backups to there, uh, potentially spinning things up if need be. Plus there's other options. There's, uh, uh, you can have, your, you know, just a colo facility where maybe you're going to actually implement your own, let's say, VMware environment that's running on whatever compute you use. Maybe you've got, you know, a flash array uh, powering that as well. It's just not your own site. I've also seen things like, for instance, in um, higher ed, sometimes two different universities will partner up and use each other as the DR site for the other. If, let's say, they're smaller universities and they only have a, a single campus, it's a way to get stuff uh, off campus. I've seen some of that uh, even with uh, cities and towns. So I, I saw that recently between, I think it was a city police department and, and the county using each other's DR. So there's a lot of ways to be able to structure this, whether it's going to be your own infrastructure that you're managing or it's going to be the provider's uh, infrastructure. Um, one thing that I will mention that it's kind of interesting and maybe somewhat related to the question is I read an article and I don't remember the exact numbers but it was just earlier this week uh, that talked about the uh, number of vulnerabilities that were discovered across public cloud providers and I thought wow I didn't realize there are this many known vulnerabilities between you know Azure Google Cloud Platform Amazon and then it was noted that the uh, um, issues really aren't because those environments themselves aren't secure because Microsoft, Amazon, Google, um, IBM, they've got a cloud, all these guys, they, they do a really good job of securing things. It's actually from the customers running infrastructure within those environments that don't lock those down. So that it is something to think about is if you are going to leverage the public cloud, you still want to make sure you secure those resources just as if you would, se you would secure your own resources, uh, resources in your own environment. Um, but anyway, so I know it's a bit of a, a long answer, but there are multiple options there besides using just the uh, the public cloud uh, as far as off-site backups and replication and, and things like that. Excellent, excellent. I like that. A, a number of different options. There's an options for everyone depending on the size of their company and, and their budget and their requirements. So, well, it looks mm -hmm. like we're running out of time. Uh, on the event today, I want to make sure I award the $300 gift card before we go. That's going to Nick Hannes of Pennsylvania. Congratulations, Nick. We'll reach out to you to deliver your gift card. And I also want to remind everyone to make sure you check out the handout that's available for download there in the audience console. It's a joint solution brief on the Veeam and Pure Storage solution that you learned about on today's event. Nick and Joe, thank you so much for being on the event today. Great webinar, great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for joining and, us. Yeah, thank you, everyone out there in the audience, for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. For more information, make sure you visit purestorage.com and veeam.com. The URLs are right there in the slides. You can check those out and visit those for more information. I hope everyone enjoyed the event and learned a lot. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.